Oh, hello, we're back. <laughs> we got some new microphones this time. Mm -hmm. We got... They worked. Oh, someone's tested. already following us. Yep. All right, we got some new wines. We're going to start with something a little different. We're actually going to start off by introducing ourselves. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ryan, we're going to start with you. Yep. Well, you already introduced me. My name is Ryan Moses, and I have Harley Hoffman here with me. Uh, we are here Pleasure. to uh, taste some delicious Napa wine. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that we are bringing this bottle today is not because we have a lot of it for sale, but it's just going to demonstrate some of the fantastic wines that we actually have on a new page we added to the site. Um, it's called Specials right now, where basically it's a lot of in-stock uh, wine that we have discounted at 15%. Mm -hmm. On any any given purchase, all, and all fall. so it ends up being some random bin ends and some, um, uh, uh, but some fantastic wines. There's some gems in there, and this is an example. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason we brought this out today is to sort of highlight some of the quality that we have in there. There's some hundred pointers in there. There's some uh, very rare wines. I was looking at uh, there's some 2001 Vielle Julien uh, Cuvée Reserve, which is a, a phenomenal bottle of wine, really special, and there's some of that in there. Uh, Favia is a Napa project uh, with uh, Annie Favia and her, uh, her husband, Andy Erickson, who is a winemaker extraordinaire in Napa. And they, I'm going to open this one mm -hmm. while I'm chatting and talking. Yep. Um, they actually uh, got a 100 point score for this wine in 2012. Uh, Robert Parker didn't actually rate the 2005. Uh, hey, so check. Marks. We got another person joining us. Come on in, bring up a chair. Come on in, in Alex. Here. Pull up a chair. In here, since why? There we go. All right, so I think I'm four for four with uh, opening bottles of wine so far. Let's see if I can pull up this one. Break. Let's see, clean cork, of course. Absolutely beautiful. Yep. That's the kind of stuff that you like to see. Uh, but like I was saying, we were mentioning the fact that this yeah. this this specific wine, this specific cuvee, mm -hmm. which is usually a split of a Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc, which just got 100 points from Parker in 2012. This is the 05, not rated, but a little bit under the radar and probably uh, less expensive for that. Uh, around 100 cases are made per vintage, so there's not really that much on the market, not much to go around. And, you know, it's Maybe little right. gems like these and maybe a little bit off the beaten path or rare selections or wines that don't necessarily get... Uh, critical acclaim, but still are uh, fantastic bottles of wine that you can find on the special page. If you go to the homepage at vinfolio.com, uh, there's a, a list of, of ways to sort, ways to shop, mm -hmm. and there's a little button called specials, and you can browse from there. Or you can send us an email, um, wineoffers at vinfolio.com, and we can send you over a specific sortable list of the wines that are available um, in this selection. Uh, and so I think it's just a phenomenal project. It needs a little bit of airtime. And, you know, this is a good opportunity to do it, but, I mean, let's talk about the wine, look at the wine. Obviously, I showed the Favia bottle, and immediately you're talking about Andy Erickson, so I don't know if you want to add some color there. Um, I'm not sure exactly what Eric, Andy Erickson's first year uh, making his own label was, but he uh, was a veteran at uh, the World Renowned Screaming Eagle Winery uh, as the winemaker there. Um, certainly has a track record on consulting and other projects um, throughout the valley. Interesting to taste some older vintages here because usually uh, in the current market we see his newer stuff and you know not stuff with, with age on it. So yeah. how come yeah. how come we don't see his older stuff typically? What's the scoop of that? Well, you know, I think a lot of the a lot of the obviously when you're talking about local wineries and, and local availability, you're talking about current vintages. We actually did get some of this from the 07 vintage, which got 97 points from Parker uh, a few days ago as part of a private seller, and so. Um, the wine does show up. It's just that you know, wine like this that you have 100 cases made. Most of it's going to mailing list customers. You're not really going to see much of it available. So um, to even have it is is a is a pretty cool thing. Like you said, Andy Erickson's uh, you know, sort of um, the you know rock star style winemaker with everyone and his cousin you know on on the resume and all the top labels that you can think of in Napa. And I also think it's interesting, especially because there's been a lot of favor for Cabernet Franc recently, especially from Parker, but from a lot of different reviewers. And so to see another um, not dominated 50-50 Cab and Cab Franc type wine get that kind of acclaim sort of shows, um, I think, sort of highlights a big trend in, in Napa and winemaking in general. A lot of Tuscan Cab Franc and obviously 
right bank Bordeaux and what have you. Got a quick shout out. We've got Everton from Brazil saying hi. Everton, how are you What's doing? Up, Everton? Thanks for joining us. Everton, is that, is, that, is that your name? Everton from Brazil? Different name? <laughs> <laughs> What do you think? Pick it up here on the nose, Harley. Well, I gotta wait for a little bit of that alcohol to blow off. Mine's a little hot right now, but it's running hot. I get some of those uh, red cherries, red fruit, raspberries. Definitely smell that wood too, right up in there. It almost felt a little more open right when we right when we popped the cork, as opposed to like right now. It seems it's like it's going away a little bit in the glass. So I'm getting a little of that herbal old, you know, that Napa like bay leaf, you know, slight mint, mint yeah. notes. Mm -hmm. Wait, is that Napa or is that Cap Franc? I think it's a, I think it's a combination of both. You combination know? of both. Now, what makes you say when you say alcohol on the nose? What makes you say that? Is it a sharpness? Is it a sharpness? Intensity? A sharpness. Yeah. Feel it in the back of those nose hairs right there. <laughs> right where they start. The burning. High like up in my like nose. you feel your nose just expand, <laughs> taking it in. We got 14.8 on the label there. Is mm -hmm. that correct? 14.8 alcohol level. That's that's right. Like, where does that fall in the spectrum? Is that high? Isn't that pretty far for the course? Kind of, kind of normal. Yeah. Yeah. It falls in the mid range to high. Right in the middle. Like, yeah, right where it needs to be. We're gonna say. I mean, if you look at yeah. if you look at Cab and Cab Franc from Bordeaux, you're mm -hmm. probably looking at 13 to 13.5 mm -hmm. range. Some of the more modern producers pushing 15 percent Napa. You're probably seeing somewhere from. 14 to 16 depending on the specific um, producer the fun part is that the actual variance that you can have between what's in the bottle and what's on the label is a uh, percent and a half really so there's actually a three percent range that you can be wrong there which when you're talking about three percent the difference between 14 percent and 17 percent there's obviously <laughs> so you're, you're saying this could be 17 percent possibly no, it's it's. No, I, you know, I'm like sure, especially when you're especially when you're that specific <laughs> and you're in a modern winemaking region where you have everything to test. I mean, they have nothing to lose, nothing to gain by, um, you know, by by saying exactly what's in there. There's uh, certainly a, a ta there's certain tax uh, levels that also go into that. Where yeah, you're paying higher taxes on higher alcohol levels. There's also import regulations if it's over a certain percent. Um, so you're you're sort of incentivized to kind of try to duck as low as you can. I wouldn't say as low as but you can, but there's certain, there's certain thresholds. Yeah. Exporting, yeah. yeah. But, I, you know, I, again, I don't know. I mean, being plugged into wineries and winemakers, I think there's a lot of super, there's a lot of talk about um, fudging that number a lot, but I really don't think that many people are, have any specific incentive to do that. Um, it's, right. just, it's just sort of, I don't know, it seems like really on the periphery and very conspiracy theory-ish, but it's not necessarily a big practice or that much of a concern. Um, well, and if you, if you try to go... It certainly may help if you're a new upcoming winery or you know, start <laughs> yeah. a 100 case production. Yeah. Um, but there's an expectation, right, that if you produce a certain type of wine, it's got to fall in a certain range. Like, you wouldn't be to your benefit to, to it stay low. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be the determining factor on how a wine expresses itself. It is, mm -hmm. it is part of, it is a, it is a byproduct of the, of the production process and it's basically, you should be picking on flavor profile in the vineyard and you should be picking on the kind of, you know, weather that's there and decisions you want to make for the end wine, but saying that you want to make a 16% wine or 14% wine doesn't mean that a 16% wine is going to be better than a 14 or the other way around. I mean, to determine the quality of a wine on its alcohol is sort of silly. I mean, if you if you want to talk about if you want to talk about, okay, I pick this up and I'm smelling it and it smells sharp, or I'm gasping after I drink it because there's so much alcohol in there. Um, we sold some we we sold some we're offering some Chris Ringland wines today, mm -hmm. and one of them that we're offering is 17.6 percent alcohol, and which means that it could be 19. <laughs> she means that it could be 19, but it's could a be massive vodka. wine. We're not it's a massive tell you. wine, but it's a world-class wine. It just like, I mean, just like your your most expressive and intellectual burgundies are the finest wines in the world that are going to be in that 12 and a half to 13 and a half range. It doesn't, it sort of, you know, might define a region a little bit, but it doesn't define the quality of the wine. Right. It comes down to balance, right? Yeah. yeah. What would you rate this one, Alex? Uh, I don't give out ratings. <laughs> Just smiley faces. Either I like it or not. I mean, I, I you know, 
this is starting to, for me, this is starting to show some secondary in between tertiary aromas already at, in the 05. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to see where the fruit is going to go in this wine right now. Mm -hmm. It could be in a funky stage as a lot of the 05s are yeah. as well. Um, so and it's kind of hard to tell at this point. I wouldn't, you know, I would like to see it maybe in a, in a couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I certainly with food on the table, uh, you know, as well. So definitely has a structure to age. I think that the, uh, I mean, the structure of the wine. It's a, it's a, it's a very pretty wine, very beautiful wine, good concentration, very expressive. Um, I definitely agree. You can tell the age there, but more in that secondary sort of. It's, it's definitely got a while to go. It's not like you're, you're at the end of the. Yeah. At the end of it. What about you? You want to put a rating on this? What do you, what do you rate this? It's <laughs> a like rating, Harley. I just wanted to hear Alex's opinion. <laughs> I, don't want to put a rating on I mean, it's 2000, it's a 2005, yeah. so it's 10 years in. Yeah. So, like, when, no when are you going to, you, you say you kind of want to see it age longer? Well, I mean, if, if I were, to, if, I were drink drink it, if I were to drink this at home, I would have opened it and decanted yeah. Yeah. it. Two hours, let it go. Three hours ago, something yeah, like you'd be, that. You'd say you'd be having a lot more different comments. At, at this I point think by the time we get to the bottom of this bottle, it's <laughs> going to be different. Get about another hour. And so next, <laughs> so next time, I think we need to start the we need to start the periscope by basically, um, you know, drinking three quarters of the bottle and then joining you after that, and right. so you can you can tell. Or our next periscope, we could open the bottle and let it sit in front of the camera for two hours. Well. There you go. And you could <laughs> do watch. A little time, do a little time. Is it, is it better to watch? <laughs> so, would you rather watch paint yeah. peel or watch wine decant? Yeah. No, it's it's. Um, we asked the other day. We had a we had a um, a winemaker and he was talking yeah. about tasting with Robert Parker, and I thought it was fascinating just for the idea that how do you taste something with critics? Because when the wine, if I'm going to show a really young wine that I might show to a critic or even older wines that might show better with decanting, am I going to pop the cork and pour it for them or am I going to decant it? Because if I want my wine to show as well as I can, I'm probably going to decant it. I'm probably going to figure out when they're coming and make sure it's, it's in the ideal state. But the funny thing is all those chateaus in Bordeaux, they all vary. You know, some people have yeah. it right in front of a critic and some people Open always have it decanted, you know, on yeah. the table ready to go. Mm -hmm. There's definitely less variables if, it, if you're just pulling the cork and always tasting that way, but just another small nuance of, mm -hmm. of evaluating, rating, mm -hmm. understanding, appreciating wine. We'll be decanting tomorrow in the, in the tasting. Uh, yeah, let's talk about the tastings that we have tomorrow. We have a, we have a pretty, uh, pretty awesome event and pretty big deal here, and we're going to be joining everyone at, I think, starting at 3.30 tomorrow afternoon. So 3.30, we have a lineup of six wines. Um, it's with Emmanuel Gretz from, from Tuscany, the winery BB Gretz. Um, he's uh, basically a partner in the winery. He's here traveling in the U.S. doing some sales and he's taking his time to stop by and see us here. Uh, so we look forward to sharing those wines with you then. We have some on the site and we'll also be featuring an offer just thereafter the tasting. Cool. What do we have available for sale right now? Um, on the site we have the 2010 Testamata. Yep. Um, 98 points James Suckling, 2011 mm -hmm. Testamata, 98 points James Suckling, 2012 Testamata, which is the new release. Mm -hmm. um, that should be available in November for shipping. Uh, we're also going to taste their kind of Tete Duve Calore, uh, the 2010, mm -hmm. um, not the 2009 as expected. So mm -hmm. we're going to taste the 10, you know, obviously the probably. Uh, vintage of the decade mm -hmm. uh, in Tuscany, so that should be exciting to taste that. And we're going to taste this uh, really cool wine called uh, Bougia, I mean, from and Sonica grapes, which is also on the site, uh, 2014, from a little island off G uh, off Tuscany called Giglio. So it's great stuff. Awesome. I mean, this, this is the uh, you know one of one of the, the the core ideas of doing this kind of thing is to give our customers access to the kind of um, to the kind of interactions that we get to have with some of the winemakers and producers out there and some of the people in the wine world that don't normally uh, take the time to do it. So we're really happy to be able to, to, to taste the wines and introduce people, come with questions, and, and uh, right. we'll be tasting the wines and looking through everything. So and, really and looking forward to it. Periscope is interactive. So if anyone, when you're doing this tasting, if you have comments, you just mm -hmm. type them right in and we'll answer them. Yeah. That's at 3.30 tomorrow Pacific time. Right in this spot yep, on right camera. Right in this spot. In this spot online, the whole deal. So this is sold out on our site. What's it typically go for? What are we looking at for this kind of wine? You know, uh, the, the current vintages are pretty much not available because they've been so successful, because they're getting such huge scores. 
I wouldn't even know. I would imagine something like this at a 100 point wine goes for $300 because of the small production or even more. Uh, I think this was on the site for around $100. And I think for good vintages like the 07, you'll pay, you might pay in the mid 100s or something along those lines. It's a, it's, it's pretty reasonable for the kind of, um, for the kind of pedigree that it has in so far as the vineyards and the mm -hmm. producers, um, but it is definitely a, a you know premium level wine. And we could potentially have some access to the recent vintages of this from the producer uh, locally. So let us know if you're looking for that as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Cool. I mean, this is yeah. If I there's like it. if there's ever anything you're looking for, just hit us up mm -hmm. because we have a lot of ways we can ask and and potentially get wines that you may not be able to get somewhere else. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Some more wine. Happy taste. This is great. <laughs> We're gonna have some more wine. All right. Wednesday. See you tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.